workshop in some form or other. This is that's what you're after. You came to the right place. I am Beth Kramer, and I live in Seattle. I just had a place here in Hot Springs, so I'm here and there. And I would like this workshop to be something where we're working together, not just me talking to you. But I will give you the story of what we've been through, and then the, uh, there'll be ways that I want you to interact with me and each other. And I like to find out a little bit about the people in the room so that I can talk uh, some of my experience to what you might be after. So I would love it if you would say your name, where you're from, and if you have a project in the works. Or if you don't, maybe there's something specific you want to get out of this lecture and uh, or workshop. So would you like to start? Yeah. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm originally from Tacoma, Washington. And I live in Missoula. Pardon? No, I live in Missoula. Uh -huh. Okay. You got a project you're working on? or? No, not really. Not yet? <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Marie Snyder, and I'm from Big Fork, but I live in Missoula, and my life is project it's in the works, and I forget what this was called, but it's something about um, like growing on public land. Yes, yes. And I'm really interested in public land, yes. like land management mm -hmm. type stuff. Okay, and I am saying that the word commons is public land, and that was how it was in the title too, so it's like... It's common because it's ours. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm from West Palm Beach, Florida. Originally reside in Missoula now. Um, currently, I have a very small, like like six plant, few herbs, like garden. I'm working on. Uh, we live in an apartment complex, but I'm working on for maybe next year how to meet in the garden. <laughs> Um, maybe add something sustainable with like chickens and whatnot, try to reduce waste. We have recycling set up now, so that's kind of like my future plans. Right now I just have a porch garden though, but you do what you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name's Tapo Siggins, I live in Hot Springs. I moved here about six weeks ago and inherited this huge garden that is crying <laughs> for lots of reasons and I live in a neighborhood where a lot of people um, their gardens failed this year and a lot of them because of the grasshoppers and so I'm learning a lot of things here about how to look at this garden that's much bigger than me and I, I'm processing and believing that I'm going to be inviting my neighbors uh, into my garden no, I'm not my garden and asking them if they wanted it to be our garden Mm -hmm. Not not this year, but in the spring. But we'll start in this fall, because I have this this piece of garden that's bigger than all of their little gardens, and a lot of theirs failed a lot. And I and they're I've gotten to know them, and, all, and I knew some of them before. But anyhow, that's what's been coming to me since I've been doing this: is that looking at this garden space that wants to be used, mm -hmm. and inviting my neighbors to do it together. Is that neighbors? Uh, I'm Jill, and I live here from Zula originally. And the project um, I am working on that I'm thinking about, hopefully gleaning some information from, is the school garden here in Hot Springs. It's right across from school when you drive in before you get to the tea. All we have really now is a, a butterfly pollinator uh, perennial and annual garden. But I want to um, establish that as a sort of a native food forest. Um, fairly low maintenance, but that, that's kind of the direction that we're kind of going with um, part of that space. So, mm -hmm. what's from your experience? Okay. I'm Alan. I recently moved here from Shoreline, Seattle. I'm now living in Hot Springs, actually, at Alameda's. And uh, I know Jackie, and I know about Beacon Food Forest, and I want to be here to support her and to get more information and express my interest in it. <coughs> I missed, is there a specific question? Yes, your name, where you're from, and what do you want to get out of this, or if you're working on a certain project. Uh, I'm Frank Tyler, I'm uh, living at Fleet and Labs, about an hour from Missoula, and I just want to find out more about uh, this project. Mm -hmm. I'm Sarah Green, for the past five years I was in Spokane on 20 acres homesteading, and now I live in a barn loft in North Idaho and like out of my car and, and I would like to learn about using public land because 
I, I want to be able to have something that can just stay there. And, and when, where I was homesteading in Spokane, it was private land that I was renting. And now that I'm gone, it's like all dried up and dead. And um, there's a piece of private property in North Idaho that I've access to that I'd like to put something on as well. But just learning about public land, because ideally I think I would like to be able to travel and go and like spread permaculture and put it down on public land in different places and then go somewhere else and do the same thing and have it be low maintenance or have people like who want to maintain it there and mm -hmm. you keep it alive. Okay. I'm Justin. Uh, I'm from Corvallis, Oregon. I'm, I'm an artist and an anarchist, so I'm kind of interested in how my anti-state philosophy plays into public land mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So. <laughs> I'm Kareem, I'm from Bozeman, and we do have, I mentioned this in the keynote yesterday, we do have, the city has a 60 acre Story Mill Community Park, and about an acre and a half of that is going to be a teaching, teaching garden and a food forest trail. Uh, and the city is particularly concerned, though, about the maintenance of the food forest trail because they can't put their maintenance crew on that. Uh, so I'm mostly curious about the social systems design yeah, yeah. around the Beacon Food Forest to be able to bring that back uh, to them. And I'm working with a group of students at Montana State University to help design in more detail the, the food forest trail. So we're going to take them through the design process mm -hmm. throughout the semester and their deliverable is a site plan and a design brief. So, yeah. My name is Casey. I'm from the U.S. I've lived in Spain for a long time. That's where I reside. Um, close by in St. Ignatius, I have some broccoli and some radishes and some spinach growing. <laughs> I know very little about any of this, um, uh, but I'm very interested in, in all of it. And the food forest, I was interested in, in learning more about food forests. Okay. And, um, um, Cool. I would love to cover uh, both the food forest, the ecology, and the plant piece, but I think I'm going to also um, go a little more heavy on the social aspects because on public land, that's actually what is needed to get your hands on it and to maintain it. And we have had a journey ourselves on learning, a really steep learning curve there. We, we, um, how many of you guys know what a food forest is? Okay. And how many of you have ever planted a fruit tree? Raise your hand to plant a fruit tree and create a guild underneath that fruit tree. Okay. What is a guild? Does anyone know what a guild is? Do you want to explain? Kind of, sort of. Yeah. Um, so the way the way I learned it, it was there's mutual support guilds. What are the other guilds? Mutual support guilds. It's like where you. It's just like companion planting. It's just like growing things together. To serve a function, and that's your guild of plants. Yes, around a central tree or a, a large shrub. So you, okay, it's kind of like the small building block of a food forest where you have a tree or a large shrub at the center, and then you're putting plants around it to complement them, and they're working together. And um, it, eventually, the forest is a perennial system, so you have all perennial plants that are going to come back year after year, and then as you and, and as you're starting it, you have to intervene. Well, you know, here and there, but eventually you're going to be able to step back and watch the forest behave like a forest. So instead of being regular forest and, uh, that we have all around us here in Montana and out in, out in um, our coastal regions, we have these more temperate forests with more rain. You would like it to be able to manage itself with a little bit of intervention uh, and, and that these plants are coming back year after year, not like a vegetable garden. Um, but I will talk about the role of vegetables inside that food forest. You can have perennial vegetables, which, does anyone know what, a couple? Can you name a couple of perennial vegetables? Asparagus. Asparagus. Uh, no, sorry. Lovage. Or Lovage. Yes, yeah. that's a, well, that was a meal last night. Kale. Sorrel. Kale. Some mm -hmm. kales come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, Russian kale. Yeah, and so, and there's a tree kale. So, there are vegetables that we can plant into the system. And then there is there is a place for the annuals. Right now there's a workshop on the annuals, so that because you couldn't be in there. I would say, and I'll add to this, that um, in, a in a food forest, when it's young, or on the edges where there's more sun, you can definitely plant your vegetable plants. And, and um, 
I'll tell you some of our story about how we got started. Um, so I'll share a story about our process of how we got our hands on the land and then the process to establish the food forest and then the process uh, of how we engaged the community and they're kind of all, all interwoven. They didn't really happen that way in sequence. I was in a permaculture design class in 2009. I had already 20, 25 years of organic farming and horticultural experience. And when I got into that class, um, it really helped me like uh, articulate some things that I've already been observing and uh, give me the jargon and the lingo, but it was like, oh, of course. And some of the stuff was, oh yeah, I know that. So then I had this palette, this, uh, this fertile ground for more info because some people ask me, should I take a permaculture design class? And uh, of course it's up to you, but with the background that I had, I felt a little bit bored in a permaculture design class, but it gave me, I already had the fertile ground to get more information. If, you've if you don't have the history or a background, absolutely enjoy a permaculture design course, but I think it's really useful. I, I work with someone who's never taken a permaculture design class course. He has a landscaping installation business. He has a lot, but he doesn't have uh, some of the layers that you do get from a permaculture design course. So I took that course in 2009, and uh, one of my friends was in it, and our project became the Vegan Food Forest. We, we just called it a food forest in Jefferson Park in Seattle on a hill called Beacon Hill. And when we um, um, were looking at this piece of land, Glenn had this history in this neighborhood. He'd already lived in the neighborhood for 20 years, and that neighborhood had been through the neighborhood design process. So Seattle has this really great history of having a department of neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And we have people visiting the food forest from all over the world that they're designers and planners and from around the country and from Holland, and they don't even have anything like that. They don't have a department of neighborhoods like we do. So we had that like extra oomph of like, there's a whole department in the city government that is designed to help the community do things in their community. There's grants, there's community gardens that they um, help make happen. And so we were really blessed to have that. So that's the history. We owe so much to the people who came before us for 20 years who were involved in the community process that Kareem had described yesterday. When the city says, we've got something going on in your neighborhood, show up. Start listening to them and start being heard. Oh, we've got this, uh, these um, sidewalk improvements in your neighborhood. We're going to have a hearing next week, or that's how we, we're, we're informed of what's going on. Show up and say, by the way, do we have room along those sidewalks for some berry shrubs? Or go and listen, like, what are your, what's going on there? So because of the people who came before us on Beacon Hill, we were able to step into a community process that was accustomed to having the citizens speak up and say, we would like a piece of this, or how do we do that? And so when we looked at that piece of land, oh, I know what that is. Oh, this is one of the plants that I had fallen in love with at the Vegan Food Forest, and this mm -hmm. kind of starts me off, and we'll, we'll end it with that too. Does anyone recognize this, the shape of it at all? It wouldn't grow out here, but it grows in Seattle. It's, it's a, uh, pomegranate. Oh. So we were able to, we were able to, this is the pomegranate oh. flower. So it's one of these oh, plants that I've learned. This is hard to see, is it? No, it looks Okay. Nice. This is the land we looked at. It's eight acres on a slope. Uh, we designed it in our permaculture design class, and it was our dream plan. And we worked on it, and we added all the features we're supposed to add. And when we presented it to our group at the end, and had, and our client was one of the neighborhood activists, People are like, this looks really good. Why don't you go to the city and see what you can do? So we went to the department neighborhoods. We said, we would love to put a food forest here. And she said, so what? That's two of you or four of you. If you're interested, how do I know the rest of your neighborhood's interested? Go out, go talk to the neighbors, and come back when you can show us that there's more interest than just the four of you because this is a neighborhood, this is a city, this is public land. We have to hear what your neighborhood wants. So we went out to farmers markets, festivals, um, we set up a table next to the grocery store and we just talked to people. And we had a nice sketch of the, de of the design, the, the dream design, and that's really helpful to have just some kind of visual, because Glenn was an artist, some kind of good sketchy, that's a nice thing to take around with you. Even if you show pictures of plants fully abundant and um, producing, you can show that 
to people um, when, when, when you want to get their attention. So we had them leave their name and an email number and an email address, and we had about 400 names. It took all summer. Christine was on our team, and she made these little seed packets. She ordered big batches of seed, and then she made these cute little seed packets and had the name on it and gave it out to people as an exchange. It's like, hey, I need something from you. I need your email address. No, actually, I have something to give you as well. So that was like the, the first step in always looking at this as reciprocal and not always like, g g give me your attention, give, give, give us your time. It was more like, I have something to give to you. Would you like to talk to me? And this was the slope that we started with. And then we uh, showed up with 400 names on our email list, and the city said, okay, you got some traction, you can apply for a grant. So we applied for a $20,000 grant to start the community design process, because what we had created in the course was not going to be put overlaid on the land. So we went through community design process where we put mailers in the mail in five languages to our neighbors. We uh, talk to local newspapers. We have a fly flying around our face. No. Um, and, and through three different community design meetings, we came up with this. And that is our schematic plan that we actually had to hire a landscape architect. But when we put out the call to um, the professional community, we required that the landscape architect have a permaculture designer on staff. So it, it was um, a process that actually like woke up the architect's teams. And this was in 2010. Um, this was in 2010 about permaculture. And so we had seven different arch landscape architecture firms apply to us. And you could tell they went out looking for permaculturists. They didn't even have them on their stacks. And a couple of teams created themselves to um, do this project. And we hired uh, Margaret Harrison as a landscape architect and Jenny Pell who is a permaculture teacher and designer. They, we had an interview process. We went, through, we went through all these phases in the professional realm. Like we had to put it in the local papers for, up for the call for proposals. We had to have a set of questions that we had to ask from every team so it was consistent and not biased. We chose to interview three out of seven teams. And then we got called. Why did you pick us? Right? So it's like a, it's a real, it's a real, um, it's a, if you're in the game, you, either, we had to dive in and really get started. And so um, we had a community design process that came up with a schematic plan. When we asked for permission to start planning on this from the land manager, um, they said, we said, can we do four acres? They said, take seven. <laughs> we were pretty amazed. Well, it turns out this is, this is land that they have to manage and they have a budget. And it was, it's Seattle Public Utilities. They are the land manager. And they are managing the water. There's a big reservoir up here, and it's been put underground in tanks. It used to be an open water reservoir for since the 1920s. And when 9-11 um, happened, the federal government required all, all reservoirs be put underground to be more protected. So it opened up this park in more space, because this site used to be fenced all around. We lived in that neighborhood probably during that time. And so they have to manage this land as water quality land. And that's the theme of our conference, right? Water is life. So we are under a, a set of a little extra strict guidelines. No garbage cans, no toilets, no animals, no uh, non-commercially composted animal manure. So someone, she came and brought our rabbit poop. And I'm like, sorry, we can't take it. But we can take, we can get manure that's been through a commercial facility. Somebody's got goats and somebody's got cats. Uh, horses can't take it on site right now. But we, are, we know we're going to affect rules. No standing water. This was a, a pond, a series of ponds in our dream plan. Now we just leave it alone as a wetland. But it's a placeholder because we hope someday that we're going to have the visions we like. So the schematic plan came out two years after the dream plan. Mm -hmm. So 2009 was the dream plan, 2011 the schematic plan was finalized. We went through a lot of meetings with the city. We had community design process, the, the architect and the permaculture designer would take it back and work on it and then they'd bring back options and people would come to these meetings. We thought we would get 30, which is kind of an, a good number. We got 60 people because people were really excited about this concept and it had a really simple name, food forest. And so, 
people didn't really have to ask very often, what is that? But if they did, it was really easy. Picture a forest. Now picture everything in that forest as edible. That was, that was, that's a really good starting point. Is like, like you'd said in the you know, get rid of the jargon and just talk about an edible park. And what, what, was, what has confused people all along the way who asked us questions and, and in the beginning was, what is this? And our landscape architect, she was not, you know, she wasn't full of herself. She's like, it's just a pretty picture. This is not your field truth. This is just sort of a roadmap for the future. So this is seven acres. And the city said, yeah, you can, that's your overall plan, but you, can, you need to start with just so you get to start with one and three quarter acres, they said to us. That's a quarter of your site. And so once you have your schematic, schematic site plan, um, sometimes it's called master plan, what you do have here are placeholders of elements. So an element is something like the children's area. An element is the arboretum. An element is gathering places. Another element is the orchard. Another element could be considered uh, dis disabled access. Uh, and another element um, is like uh, the play fields and stuff. So you have a, a site plan, but then when you start designing the detail, that's when the field truth comes in. So you get down in the field and you're like, oh, we got to change that path. It doesn't work on the slope that's there. Or, oh, it's really, really, really wet here. We can't really put stuff here. Or we'll have to build raised beds with logs in them. The hoople beds, log beds, I like to call them. So two years took us to get to this. And as I go along here, I'm going to start calling out these permaculture principles, and I'd love it if you guys did too. These are um, outlined by David Holmgren. Have you guys noticed that the principles are showing up in different ways in different books? More books are coming out. People are like massaging these and describing them in different ways. And I'm, I think that's okay. I mean, it's not really like this solid permaculture dogma. It's like, well, it looks call it this because that kind of makes more sense to us. And if you're teaching a class or a course, you know, maybe it's going to resonate with you better to teach it in your, with your words and your experience. So these, I like these ones because these are the ones I first learned and there's a nice diagram in here that you'll see that has some pictures. So when this, the city department of uh, public utilities said you can only start with one and three quarter acres, that's, that, they were really smart there. So use small and slow solutions. So we had to go with that. And then when we, when we wanted to design this, we had to come up with another $11,000 to pay the architects, the landscape architects, to come up with diagrams because this is a steep slope. How do you do the paths? How do you, how do, you do this and that? $11,000 is pretty steep, but that's the going rate. And then we had to get, uh, we got, we got um, another $100,000 to terrace it. So this part, ended up being more park-like, and this part so far right now is our food forest. So that's phase one, and currently we are in phase two, and we're designing phase two, we've got it as a schematic, and we're right in the middle of construction, construction documents right now that'll be approved by the city, and then we're going to tear some of these paths. We're going to do less, um, less human imposition in this area. But what it was is in those community design meetings, people said, we want berries, we want community garden plots where a family has their own allotment. So we had to listen to what this, the community wanted in order to um, design something that, that, uh, that had traction with the city, that we knew that people would feel empowered and that they would come and help here. So the first thing that we did was we um, looked at that steep slope and recognized it was pretty wet. And instead of digging the key line, have, you guys know what key line is? So that's something that's taught in permaculture where it's a, it was a technique named and come up with by a guy in Australia who's doing a lot of farming on dry land. So we copied the key line by renting a ditch digger. So we dug these deep ditches on the hillside. We got this hillside. And we dug the deep ditches to slow the water down so that the water would sink into them. And we filled them with um, wood chips and mushroom spores so that they could start populating deeper in there. We found out that the water doesn't really want to leave this site when it's after rain, rain, rain. So instead of being right on contour to hold the water that it would seep into the land, they were just slightly off contour. 
and, and they would still run the water towards the wetland, but also hopefully seep into the land. So we had all this plan, we like learned about the permaculture, and we had these diagrams, but we found out the site's too wet. So what did we do? We creatively use and respond to the changes, the things that we found out that were slightly different on site. And it turns out, we also had to pull our trees up. We planted these trees that were on the slope. And the technique is, yeah, you're on a slope, you gotta kinda like do a little back eddy, you wanna make sure the tree's getting water. It's still too wet. Mm -hmm. So we had to like pull those trees out and put them up on raised, or more on raised beds. So you see, yeah. What type of mushrooms did you put in the We soil? We contacted Fungi Perfecti. We looked in their catalog and we bought a, a container of their spores that are good for perennial systems. So I don't have the list. It was a big list. And they'll say, once those mushrooms bloom or even just start uh, mycelium like running their roots, they'll compete with each other and the one suited to your site will bloom. You don't even have to put the mushrooms in there. If you've got wood chips, your mushrooms are going to show up. So the first thing that we... Uh, started with when we started working on the land, that's 2012. So from 2010 to 2011, we finally got to make ground on tw in, in September 2012. This will be our five year anniversary. And we started by getting wood chips from the Parks Department and laying down the cardboard. The Parks Department loved our project. And the city noticed how inclusive we were and how much we were working with other people and other groups is that they were starting to believe in us and they were letting us get this project going because they don't have the money to do it. So they were, they were watching us closely, they were coming to our meetings, they, were, they helped set up our email listserv because they had that community department. And they check on us, they check on our meeting, meeting minutes and, we're, and, and they, ha they say things like, you're a little white, you know, your group is really white for this neighborhood. You're too white. And we're like, well, nobody seems to want to come out. And we think if we build it, they'll come. And they're like, no. You don't build something that people are going to come to because you don't even know what they want. Mm -hmm. So we really made an effort to go out into the schools and to the local newspapers and the um, senior centers. And El Centro de la Raza is, is a community agency that works on the hill with many different groups, and especially seniors. We met with them, and we were we, we like learn to listen, that, that's for sure. There were definitely embarrassing moments, definitely moments where I learned to, I really learned a lot through this project about um, shame or being ashamed that I'm white or having privilege. I like, have, we, we, we ended up having more people come to our team and like help open our eyes and then when I feel like shit, they'd be like, no, I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, I'm just saying, just notice how, what you just said or just notice how, you can include people. My intent is not to shame you. And so it took me some years and I, I'm, I'm, I'm all willing to say, oops, I made a mistake. Or like calling somebody else out on it. And then you have this like trouble. You call somebody else out on it and then they're like, they feel like shit. So they, so there's been a long process of bringing many people from the neighborhood in. If you get a look on the ground and you look in these pictures, there's all kinds of people come out to these work parties. Yes, there's a lot of white young people. But this is what it looked like on the ground. It's like we're, we dug holes for the trees. We marked the trees. This is our first work party. We dug holes for the trees and marked them. And then we spread all the wood chips and we planted the trees. Mm -hmm. And we left it. We pretty much left that alone for the first six months. It was of trees and wood chips. So we had September where the cardboard and wood chips went down. And we, went, we worked that all winter. We kept like sheet mulching more of the grass, leaving grass in place gaining all of the roots and structure from that organic matter of grass, converting it. And then the trees went in, and um, we took pictures all the time. We made people happy, we made Facebook posts, we celebrated ourselves. We like applauded everyone who came, we always made sure we had food. All of us are volunteers, and we've been doing this steadily for five years, and mainly volunteers. Trickling in a little bit of uh, stipend here and there, we learned to ask for a little bit of money from situations, but in those first years, it was volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. I found a piece of scrap wood, let's paint a sign. So we celebrate ourselves and open up a Facebook page right away. And this is the first, this is the result of the first weekend work five years ago. It was just our little trees, a couple of shrubs went in, and they're in the ground. Now we got a grant, we were included on a grant by another organization called City Fruit. And they managed to get $1,000 worth of trees for us. So we ordered the trees in May of that year, had to pot them up, we had a nice party, put them in someone's backyard, and then we put most, a lot of them in the ground in September. 
But there were other trees that sat in pots for that whole winter after. And some of them sat in pots for two years. Well, the ones that sat in pots for two years, they didn't make it. By the time we put them in the ground, they didn't make it. So our learning there was, see if you can buy a gift certificate instead of buying the trees right away. Mm -hmm. um, learn when your nurseries make trees available to you. Because when the trees are available in the spring, some, a lot of nurseries keep them in the refrigerator until June even. So that's okay. You can get them in June. But putting in the pot works if you're going to get them in the ground in October. But anything longer than that, just wait till the next season. When you, if you're going to plant in the fall, does anybody, has anybody found fruit trees in good shape in pots in a nursery? Mm -hmm. No. So you might as well tend your own. But if you're going to plant in the fall, either buy your own in the spring and tend them, or just get ready to put them in the ground in February, March, if your ground is maybe in April, around here. <laughs> April, May. You know, we can plant in February. Um, so if you have an opportunity to get trees, see if you can buy a gift certificate instead of buying trees when you're not ready, you know, and all your shrubs. So we started with the trees and a couple of understory shrubs, but we left the shrubs alone and we like started with the trees. And this is that same, uh, this is the same area, that's that area, two years later. This is slow going. And now, so those are those are the trees with some shrubs underneath. And now that's what it looks like. That's too wow. dark. Was, was the ground cover intentional too? Whatever yes, that, that was. That ground cover is strawberry. Yes. So we've got and we've got some um, the daylilies. I can see it better on. There's artichoke in there. You can see that in the light color. Are daylilies edible? Mm -hmm. The flowers are edible. They're quite delicious. You can. Like, I've done this with teenagers, they love this. You take a lettuce or a kale or a sorrel, you put a daylily on top, you get some chive flowers or chive fronds, some mint, and anything else you can find, it, and you roll it up, and these teenagers are eating yeah. it, and they love it. There's a succulence to the daylily. And uh, so that's what it looks like. I'm sorry that it's so dark. Here's my screen. This is, what I, this is a picture I took. Um, this year. Oh, oh, no, yeah, nice. yeah, it tilted, it tilted towards us a little bit more. Oh, nice. oh there we go. So yeah. it was kind of like Karen's oh, pictures oh, of her, of her, huh? Nice. Yeah, thing. everyone should look at that. Really this good. and so the, this is five years later. That's a good picture. And What's that main tree there? That was an Asian pear. Nice. So I'm close to it. Oh, there's some weird. nuts behind it. And the nut guild, if you notice that schematic plan, the nut guild had its own like <coughs> element in the landscape. Because nut trees get to be 70 and 80 feet wide and tall. So they, they're going to be there after I'm dead, or after all of us are dead, they're, they're still going to be there. That's kind, of, that's kind of a really nice reason to do this, right? And so uh, plum trees come and go. Semi-dwarf trees don't last that long. Dwarf trees last even less. They last 12 or 15 years. And so you, the nut guilds have to have like a place in the landscape. So here's that little tree again. Here it is a few years later, wow. two years after that. So that's a Methley plum. This is this was described in the catalogs, and the catalogs are like candy catalogs, right? Have you ever seen yeah. Rain Tree Nursery? <laughs> like you want all of them, and everything's going to be the perfect one for your landscape. They're not necessarily, but the Methley was well described, and they produced fruit wow. right away. Two years after it went in the ground, we had kindergarten kids from camp all standing underneath the tree. Come on, you're invited in here. It's okay. You can come and step on. And I'm like, okay, find the plum. And I'm like, okay, okay you can pick your plum. They couldn't believe it. Because these are city kids. They never picked the plum off a tree before. So the methley really delivered. So, you want, so what you want to do is you want to harvest a yield right away. As soon as you can, put stuff in that garden that you can harvest right away. Like the mint, like the herbs you're talking about on your back porch. That yeah. is a yield right away. That is going to feed you to keep going. So find those plants that produce right away, and those can be your annuals. So this is the upper area. So the lower area is where you had, saw those, other, those last pictures. That's all filled in. The upper area was something that was more about meeting the community's needs for what they already knew. Like, they thought they understood what a food forest was, but they didn't know what that was. So in order to appeal to the community and listen to the community, we were giving them something on the upper bench that they were familiar with. They wanted pumpkins, they wanted blueberries, they wanted 
garden plots. They wanted places to spend time together. And so this was what we had in that first year. And this is the same area now. What, what we had on, on site were crab apples, more, mainly ornamental crab apples that were placed there by the Parks Department. Our plan was to take them out, just get rid of them. We wanted something else there. The Parks Department felt pretty attached to their crab apples. And they were like, oh, I don't know, we got to talk to them. We have a meeting, we have a meeting, we don't want to share. And there was a couple of people on our team that didn't feel comfortable taking out trees that were already on their way. So actually, we've left them. And they bloom, bloom prolifically. They're feeding pollinators. You can hear the tree full of bees mm -hmm. at that time of year. And they do set tiny fruit. And in November, we've got birds eating, eating, eating. So underneath here, along the pathway, this is a very main pathway up to the big park, we put stuff that I like to call zone one plants. So plants that uh, attract people and get the most traffic, zone one is where the most you most commonly visit, or there is the most often there's people walking along this way. So it's mint. Step on it, you smell it. What is this? And raspberries. It's hard to see this. These are raspberry hedges. So the raspberries, do you guys know raspberries? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, are they ri when they're ripe, how long do you have to pick a raspberry once it's ripe? Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that day, right? So there is only one berry, in my opinion. Some people may have saved one too. But so you put the berries right next to the most traffic traffic spots. Those berries go right next to the um, the pathway, and they're recognizable. There's red ones, but we also tucked a few yellow ones in, right? So people don't know what a yellow one is, and they don't they don't pick them. So you have you know it's a staggered it's a staggered um, <laughs> harvest system. So people who don't necessarily get out right away, or they don't see the red ones, that they, know, they learn the food for us, so they're like, oh, I've got the yellow ones. And we have a lot of kids that grew up in this neighborhood with this project that know about the yellow ones. Mm -hmm. So they get in there. And, and if we're out there working and there's families walking by, you'd say, come here, come here, and then you, you have something to show them. There's a recognizable, easily recognizable stuff to people. This is a pathway off that. We had to design a pathway right in. We had the main entrance, and we're like, you know what? People just want to cut right in when they're out for a neighborhood stroll. So that's just a cutting right in. This is a, uh, a nitrogen fixing ceanothus in our region. They grow, they're up from California. They're called the California lilac. It's a nitrogen fixer that works with fungus in the soil. Most nitrogen fixers work with the bacteria in the soil. And that's a bloomer for the pollinators. We can't eat that. There's very few that we can't eat. This is the lupin. The lupin was one of our learning mistakes. We uh, planted our trees. Someone said, I've got an art project. The art project's finished. It's a living log. It's a, a, a wattle. Does anyone know what a wattle is? Um, they're used in landscape restoration, and typically they're made of straw, but some, now they're making them more with coconut husk called coir. And it's these little logs. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm done with my project. They have some native plants in them, and I would like to donate them to you. I'm like, yes. And so, you know, Giovanni, he went and made this whole brigade to bring all these. <coughs> Waddles to us, and we're excited because they have in them. Well, this woman, she called them natives. Well, she was from North Carolina. She got a grant to do this art project. She called them natives. Well, they were native to North America. These lupins are this tall now. They self seed prolifically, and they swallow out our other plants. And so we've learned to chop these lupin early on in their lives. We don't wait for them to bloom, but when we chop all their leaves, we can drop the leaves on the ground, making that living mulch. The roots that are out there running through there have all those nitrogen fixing nodules. When you chop the top, they shed their roots. So we're getting like this nice nitrogen into the system. No, we haven't soil science studied it yet. We haven't taken readings on like, is that too much or is that too little? Because we don't have the capacity right now. So as we're moving along and into this project, we knew we wanted to have, remember that schematic? We wanted a gathering place. We didn't have the money for it. So we applied for another grant, a $100,000 grant to build a gathering place. We still had other construction stuff to go. And we knew we still needed our neighbors. Our, we, the city is always saying to us, what have you done to reach out to your neighbors? Who has helped you make the decisions? And so we sent out another mailing card. And we, wrote, we have it in five languages. Five includes English. So how do we pick our languages? You can look in the neighborhood, but you can't assume. So we went to the census. Well, the census is like five to ten years behind, and the census doesn't doesn't really talk to everybody, right? If you if you're not around or you don't want to talk to the government, you don't talk to the government. So we went into the local school, the most local uh, middle school. We asked them what are the languages here, and they gave us a list of seventy-two languages. 
<laughs> we tip, picked the top four and got translation for them. Does anyone recognize any of these languages? Spanish? Yes. Somali. Uh, this is um. The one in green is Japanese. No, no. This this is the Somali. Because write Japanese as characters, it might sound like Japanese. Yeah, Naga. This is Somali, Vietnamese, Chinese, Spanish, and this one is not Mandarin, Cantonese. Yeah. yeah. So the fifth one on the list is Amharic. We have so many people in our neighborhood who speak Amharic, we don't have it there. So that, that's what we had to learn later. Is like, wow, when we were on site, there were so many people coming through. The best outreach is being right on the ground and talking to people. French wasn't up there either? No, that's not really... in Seattle. Oh, okay. Definitely what not in Seattle. Maybe saying? in British Columbia. Um, Amharic? Amharic? What is it? It's an Eastern African language oh. that's through the whole band of the Horn of Africa. Oh. Wow. Oh. Very so, we got a gathering plaza. It was uh, the, the University of um, Washington Architecture School was willing to take us on because they design and build in six weeks. So we actually had to go, how are we going to get a permit for this when we have a six weeks turnaround? Like they have to draw the design and then go into the city. So ahead of time, we were meeting with city people. We had six different departments came around our table. And we wrote a letter to the mayor to get that meeting because we weren't getting anywhere in the planning department. And we knew the Department of Planning and Development needed to prove this. It wasn't very big, but because we're next to water quality land, we had to go and get permission. And the Department of Neighborhoods kind of helped us, but they, were, they have too many things to do. So we wrote a letter to the mayor. You wait to pull out your guns. I don't like that language. You wait to call in your allies for the best times. In the beginning, we called in our allies when they, they there was a point where like we didn't hear from them. We were trying to sign our contract with our, our designer. Turned out no one would no one would respond to our emails, and we were trying to sign the contract. And it was weeks were going by, so we called the council member who we knew was championing food security. You really care about food security. You help pass through city council a policy on food security, but you have no nuts and bolts code. There's no code to address food security, but you have this big statement on policy or we're going to work on food security in our city. We want communities to be resilient, but you don't have the rules on the ground yet. So we were like that edge of like, how do you let a community take care of the land and put food on it? So we had to find, all right, Richard Collin, he is our champion. We got to call him because out. So we're on the phone with them. They stepped up for us. They said, you, you need to talk to your people. So they came out of their meetings and said, well, we, we didn't know what to do. The, depart the parks department doesn't want you because we were in the parks department at first. Nobody, you know, we don't have the budgets to handle you, but now we're going to do this, we're going to do that. So we got some answers, and they had to answer to the council member. But the people that are in the Department of Neighborhoods that your friends, they kind of like, they felt the heat. So you have to realize, when are you going to apply the heat? Because they were our friends, and they later said to us, come to us before you go to the big guys, because then we have to answer to them. So the second time we did it, we called the mayor's office. We were like, we really want to know. We've got a lot of good stuff going on. We want to know, how can we get ready for this project? We had six different departments with us in City Hall. Not City Hall, in the Columbia Tower, which is a department. Um, in there. We, you have to be willing to go into the city, in the city departments. I went to college, I know how to kiss, I know how to jump through the hoops. But there are a lot of people, it doesn't appeal to them or institutions are uncomfortable to them. So it's, it was okay for me to do it and um, other people who have a similar background to me, it was like pain in the neck, we became landscapers because we didn't want to do this. But we, we did do that and we brought other people from our neighborhood with us who would have been intimidated by that process, who wouldn't be so. So here we are in a meeting room, I'm looking around the table and I'm like, that guy's got six rings on his fingers. And he's an engineer for the department. Okay. And you're looking around and they're all like pen in hand, ready to help. They wanted, they wanted to get this project through. They were all like, how can we, all right, I'm going to do that, you're going to do that. And so Seattle has all these great city bureaucrats who really want to make a difference. Not all neighborhoods have that, not all cities have that, but you're going to find somebody inside somewhere that wants to help you. Maybe you want to put it on the library's lawn. You go find a personal library who cares about growing food or programs for kids. <clears throat> so we got a gathering plaza out of it. There's a view of the city in the background. That's what it looks like on a work party day. 
we had to, and we had, we had that card, we were inviting people to that design process, another community design process, to, to design this. And what came out of that design process was people broke off into teams to brainstorm what they wanted to see. And we wanted to stay underneath a certain threshold that we didn't have to like meet different requirements or slow the project down. So not, these roofs are not connected, they just touch each other. That was a trick, right? Mm -hmm. But what came out of the community process was let's make a tent. So we have a tent right over this that we put up for big party work days and celebrations. And it goes up like a circus tent. We've got, have you seen it? We've got ropes and it covers the center for rain or shine, and it goes back into a bin, and it goes back into the closet. That's cool. And in June, we had 80 kids from the local middle school there that this is their neighborhood park, and that's what we dreamed of. It was like, we want the local kids to call this theirs, and we tell them, like, you're going to be taking care of this because I'm not going to be around, and kind of, like, kind of looks done. <laughs> Jackie, you speak in Food Forest a non-profit. You keep on mentioning grants. Yes, okay, that's a so great you... question. We're not. We're not okay. yet. We, that's a great question, and I didn't put that in here. <coughs> and I, um, I'm going to use that in the toolkit. But when we formed ourselves, we became a group. And these, mm -hmm. these things are called friends of. So we're the friends of the vegan food forest. Mm -hmm. And you, four of us, we could create the friends of something. We have to find a nonprofit umbrella for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we have been under this nonprofit umbrella for seven years. We're growing, outgrowing them for sure. But they are a nonprofit in the city of Seattle helping community gardens, so we align. There's another one in our neighborhood that looks after our neighborhood and they're willing to be our umbrella. But the umbrella has this fiscal agency status, and so when you get a grant, it goes through them. Mm -hmm. And they usually take 7%, 5 to 10% is the range, because they have to do accounting. They have a bank account and then they have to answer to the IRS and show their paperwork every year. So we found someone who is our umbrella and they have been our umbrella ever since. We go to the meetings sometimes, we have a great relationship with them. They go to bat for us. And sometimes when we apply for grants, we find out the deadline is in two days and we need a letter from them. So, you know, staying in good relationship, have coffee with them, like just how can we help you guys? And so keeping a relationship again, like give and take instead of you, you serve us, you get our 7%. It's more like, no, how, how can we get ready better next time? So, we're in the process of, of creating a nonprofit. There's two steps, and this is nice to know. There's state status, so that's where we're going. You go not, you're, you're going to be a not for profit at the state level, which means we're an entity. We can't necessarily get money, we can't do the federal IRS thing, but we get money. Um, I'm sorry, we, we can get insurance. So that's really important. That, and we can open, uh, we can't open a bank account yet, but we can get insurance. So we started out. Sitting on those log, uh, the coir logs like that, and now we have a kitchen. We built a concrete kitchen wall. This one was a stickler. It is concrete footings, and that's sort of permanent. And the city was like, "You're not to have anything permanent there," so we apologized profusely. <laughs> and the uh, design plaza has a door that has blackboard paint, so that you can every uh, that's the door, so you can also make your lists. And when we have a work party, we circle up in the beginning. This is our team of leaders. Notice anything on, in that picture? The color? Right. Orange okay. scarves. Yeah, that's how we identify ourselves out in the field. So when people arrive late or they're looking for the leaders, the leaderships wear orange bandanas. That's something somebody came up with. How do we know? So the orange bandanas were the leaders. And then we stretch. We get everybody, when people arrive, we stretch, we get them warmed up, we get them happy, and I've heard from so many people that that's their favorite part of the day. <laughs> and we remind them to stretch before lunch, and we remind them to stretch at night when they get home because we want them to come back and, and be happy about it. There's the tent in the background. Yeah. Do you guys want to stand up and stretch right now? <laughs> it's stuffy here. Yeah. yeah? It's definitely stuffy. There you go, there's stretch. And these are the public gardens where people, families have a 10 by 10 allotment. And when the kids come, we give the kids something to do. So every time we have a work party, we think of what do the kids, can the kids do, or grandma, not the heavy physical stuff. So the kids are setting up seedlings. Who are most of your volunteers? They vary every single month. We have a work party. They, we, we say 100 people will turn out. We're now we're in the 70s, 60 in the summer. Yeah. Is it your first time? Whose first time is it? And uh, at least half the hands go up. So 
So how do they hear about it? They hear about it through Facebook or articles or uh, we got a lot of good publicity. Some mm -hmm. one terrific article was written and it just it just hit the airwaves. And people would that that's another time consuming thing when what is is giving time to media requests where people ask you. And um, I spent a lot of time talking on the phone or answering emails um, or meeting people on site for interviews and it gives you it gives you the volunteers. So it's it's time out of your uh, time out of your day, and I've gotten a little bit more comfortable talking to media, and always know that they're not going to quote you correctly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes asking you know, if you can say, "I'd like to see your article before you print it." But it's not like this issue isn't necessarily politically contentious. So if they get it wrong, I'm okay with it. This is a happy topic. Come help put food on public land. So these kids. People from everywhere. Yeah. Is it generally like high school or college kids then? Everything. Or, or everything. Like, uh, we got we got high school kids wanting to do service hours and now they come back on their own because they want to do it anyway. <laughs> we got college kids, we've got um, you know, Google's in town, they want to do a service day or like, Martin Luther King is like, Hey, can we work? And we were entertaining big groups like that and we just we'd rather go local. We don't all have the time, so let's go with people. So you have big companies like that trying to uh, Expedia, yeah, they get in there well. and get some publicity mm -hmm. for them. United Airlines had an article on us, so you're sitting in the airplane. There's an article, Amtrak magazine article on us, like wow. So it's just and and it's like the same, you know, you know, okay, I got it. Here's another hour. I'll talk to this person on the phone. And but you're an example of inclusive because what I see what you're doing here is that you plan for each population that might show up. Mm -hmm. That's really that's really a foundation. If if I'm a senior or I'm a kid or I'm handicapped or whatever, and the word is, and if I show up, mm -hmm. I don't have to feel embarrassed because exactly. you're going to have something for me mm -hmm. to do that's worthwhile and inclusive that I get to be a part of. That word of mouth travels fast, and that builds your volunteer foundation so that you don't ever know, but you're always planned for it. And you and don't know what you don't know. And that's yeah. the hugest yeah. piece here. You don't know what you don't know. There's kids, we get little baby kid wheelbarrows on purpose. We bought those. There you go. Yeah. We make sea balls so that families mm -hmm. have something to do. Because right. parents bring their kids on the weekend. And then we serve a delicious meal. And we bought stainless steel plates and stainless steel. And we take turns washing it. And we're, you know our core team got tired of washing it. So in the, when we do the circle up with our 60 volunteers, who wants to wash the plates? And someone now washes the plates and brings them back to the closet. So, which one are you seeing here when we have produce no waste. steel? Produce no waste. So, a guy came back and said, I chose this to be a volunteer at this project because you guys don't have paper plates. Mm -hmm. And um, we had signs made right away. Right away, I wrote another grant to the sustainable project because I was, and we got money to make a sign. It was pouring rain in February, we got the signs in the ground. We had a community design process for the signs. That was made out of tile that will outlast me. Wow. There's wow. two of them made out of plastic, but these there's five, four of them made out of tile. Nice. And we found a designer who just celebrates beauty. She just made like extra tiles to use for fundraisers. Mm -hmm. So we make things beautiful. And pumpkins, yeah. right? People, pumpkin. This was our first year. Yeah. This was our very first um, year in the ground, and I promised pumpkins to some radio interviewer, so I'm like, we're doing pumpkins. And to sit on the bench there and watch the families come by and rub the pumpkins and show their children pumpkins. I mean, most of the pumpkins disappeared. We That's talk right. about an ethical harvest. People read about this all over the world. They show up, they take what they want. But the ethical harvest could be leave some for somebody else, this area please don't pick, it's a family area, or this is the education garden, please don't pick. So that's been our tricky edge. How do we teach people? We've done it now where we're like, this upper area that's a more formalized park, please don't pick. This forest area down here, go for it. We have signs saying that, we need more signs. We need yeah. universal signs. You know, the red mm -hmm. X, the red hand, or just take two, or like a date, we have, we're still working on that. So giving people things that they're familiar with, that, Offering things to the neighborhood that they want, that they know. This is um, a good story, and I'll make it quicker. Michael is this young man. He was with us for a few years. He was an agriculture engineer at the University of Wisconsin. He got out of college. He's like, I don't want to do that. So he was designing and growing edible gardens as a landscaper in Seattle, and he got involved with us. And he's like, we're planting trees and working. He's like, I don't want to wait for the fruits on the trees. I want to feed this neighborhood now. So we asked for permission to take a little extra ground. We got a, a yes. And we put in um, 
this area with vegetables, and that's what we call our helix because it was a winding twist and it had a couple of rows like this. So like, we kind of went over duty on the like, let's do a pattern, you know, let's do a nature pattern, let's call it the helix. It's the hardest thing to weed and water and harvest, but we called the helix and we thought that's too fancy, right? So we called it the common thread. Mm -hmm. It still gets called helix. So we're growing vegetables the first year. In the, in the late summer, we start harvesting. We have a free farm stand, free food, free these shiny faces. The people across the street in the neighborhood is a busy road. There's um, this whole housing complex. We know there's a lot of people there. They speak Spanish. We're like have the sign in Spanish. They're not coming over. And the second, third week, Michael's like. I'm not waiting, so we put the food in the wheelbarrow, we went across the busy road, they went into the plaza, families come out, hablas espanol, and they're like, hey, would you like, yes, why don't you come across the street? Why haven't, and they go, we didn't know if we needed documents or not. We didn't know that we didn't need ID, right? So it's like, oh God, we don't even know what we don't know. We don't even know what we don't know. Because we didn't put ourselves in their shoes. So here's a family who now comes, at, comes out regularly, and I met one of the little girls at an elementary school. I went to her school to do a family night on nutrition, and she's like, I think I know you. And I'm like, <laughs> you're pretty cool for a first grader. And, and I was like, did your mama come here? Yes. So I was like reaching out to the kids' moms, and this is more work being done on the vegetable garden when people come like, this isn't permaculture, this isn't a food forest perennial system. You still need the vegetables, don't you? It's an outreach piece. Outreach piece. And we had fun. We're sewing up burlap bags to cover up the garden in one winter when we had raw beds. We hadn't assigned the garden plots. That looks like people having fun. Sewing burlap, you know, like if you can't bend down and do the garden work, you can just loosely sew up the burlap. These are coffee bags from coffee roasters. Mm -hmm. They're usually free. If any coffee shop in your neighbor that roasts should have it, tell them what it's a good cause for. The Gathering Plaza is a place to um, people gather. That's an old washing machine bin. So we're reusing old resources. We are permitted to have fires. We, every Thursday night, we have an extra work party. We only have major work parties once a, a month, but this extra work party is more for social time and people drum. There's Ed, he's our musician. So Philip said, I know how to do some solar. Do you want to put some solar panels on that house? Yes. Say yes to anybody who seems like they have initiative and then offer a feedback loop. I didn't know this guy. But he was willing to offer his services and said, so we're going to go through this process. Like, mm -hmm. Write it down, show, come to a meeting, and we'll support you. And he, we had some money. He had some money, we matched it, something like this. He put the solar panels up, we had some feedback loops, and he left. He had to leave town, and someone else had to pick up a couple of the pieces around the battery. But what, what really works for us, and we hear again and again from people, is like, you're really so inclusive. Like, I have an idea, yeah, and I want to do something and I can do it. There's wait lists to be a volunteer at other organizations in Seattle. That's wait lists and checking process. We're like, just come on! And so we don't, we, we started making, I would say, a little bit of a mistake, say, go ahead and do it, and then someone didn't, she didn't show up anymore, and we have this half done project. So you create a feedback loop. You want to do something? Do you want to, will you email me, and then I'll email you, and we'll check back on each other. So that's part of her permaculture system is, just check back on each other, and hey, here's a, I'm going to ping you, so we had um, a lot of different species that we wanted to make sure we had fruit all through the seasons so that you know, your berries usually come first and then you have your earliest plums and your earliest apples and then you have stuff late into the season. The next phase, we're going to have one big guild area with five or six trees. That's the November harvest. Mm -hmm. So somebody you know, will come, come in and be like, oh, I can do that in my yard? So you want to show people that they can do it in their yard. Does anyone know what this one is? Goji berries. Is it? No. Starts with G. Yeah, go G's. No. Gumi. Gumi. Fixes nitrogen. So these are like these are pretty good. They're a June one, so they're early. They have a, their seeds. You can eat it or you can spit it out. Mm -hmm. And it fixes nitrogen. It's a big shrubby bush, but you can chop it quite. If we had goats, we could feed the goats with this. But you can chop it a lot, and it will come back, and you'll also get the nitrogen flush. So the Gumi's are pretty um, fun. They're the Eliagnus species. We have a few of the different. I'm sorry, the Eliagnus genus. We have a few different spe species in that they genus. They can be quite sweet. They're pretty sweet. Yeah. Anybody know what we're doing there? Mushroom. It's a mushroom log. They, we had to soak those logs because they were drying out. We have them inside a hut, underneath the hops, but they end up 
create and respond to change. Like they weren't working, so we had to go back to the drawing board. A lot of this stuff, you guys, we just read it in books. We didn't know. We are like, okay. And I'm a landscaper, but I hadn't done a food forest before. And so I've got five years under my belt, so now I'm learning and I'm able to show other people. But we learn in a book and then you just try it. This is a great place for teaching classes. And this is um, all state insurance with Huffington Post was doing a Happy Neighbor series. And I was like, really? And I, I spent a whole day with the, the film crew and Glenn, and they were filming me and they were filming Glenn, and, and this woman was willing to do it, and so they came to film the crew, and um, in the end it was like, all of the footage was Glenn, and I was all mad, but you know, he's <laughs> a very handsome man. And, um, but you know, you give them that time and you end up getting more volunteers because they keep hearing about it in some way or another. And go out to other places. And that was definitely what we learned from the other women in our community was like, there's families that have enough to do, or there's organizations that have enough to do, and you say, come do our project, why don't you go lend a hand at their project? That's community. Finding your common interest, and eventually then they come out to the site. This is the Somali Community Center, no, Ethiopian Community Center. They asked us for help. Okay, you know, like, skip week into force, we get 60 volunteers this weekend. I'll, I'll leave it to the big group, and I, you know, let's help them put in their garden. And now we have a relationship with them, and they're going to bring the kids out. And all kinds of kids want to come out, and we say yes. And this is another thing. It's familiar, jack-o'-lanterns. And this little kid with his wheelbarrow, and the grandmas. So they're on the raised beds. June is 83 years old. The woman on the left, she's 83 years old. She's my friend. I never had a grandma friend who, you know, she, and I ask her things about Chinese. What are, what are Chinese people for? She's like, I left, I left China when I was 20 years old. I like tomatoes and garlic just like you do. <laughs> so we did raise beds for the grandmas so that they don't have to bend down. And we have events in the middle of the winter. We keep the, we keep the momentum going. So we have um, a, a team of people who did who wanted to have healthy meals, and it was free. And I didn't have to lift a finger. That was such a relief to have new crews of people doing. I didn't want to do dinners. They did, and they went for it. And we have lots of people coming on bikes. So we have these always have a place to block the bikes. And this is a letting go of the butterflies. I think you're noticing the kid theme here. Because for me, the kids really fuel me, and that's a joy. There, there they are, letting, the, letting them go. So the strawberries were a cover crop. They're a cover crop. Cover crops do what? They cover the ground. Mm -hmm. And they cover your other plants, too. So we're asking a plant to do something, but they also grow into your shrubs, okay? So we were wondering, should we get rid of them? No, they're green. In the middle of the summer, they're green. They're, um, they're a thicket. So they, you know, you ask it to do... It, you have to have a ground, but you also have to pull it out of your shrubs. And um, this was, came from 18 plants. The whole site is covered with strawberries. Mm -hmm. And they are a bit of a menace. And we were like, what should we do? Are they stealing water from the trees? What do you know about mm -hmm. strawberries? Oh, so. They're pretty shallow. Yeah. So if you water your trees deeply and properly, the strawberries are going to work out OK. And did you know Dave Bainline from your experience at the Bullock Farm? I've never met him, but. So he's been in this stuff for 20 years longer than me. And I'm like, Dave, what do you think? He's like, no, they're green, they're covering, their roots are shallow. I would leave them. So we did. And that's another thing is call in permies from other places. Invite them, ask them, or email them, run into them, say, I, can you help me? And that's what we did. Here's bringing more kids out. And that's our compost, the hot compost system. And those are the kids looking for the. Um, insects in the clover, and we have fun. We definitely, this is a festival, we make sure we um, have fun with it, entertain ourselves, including other people. This was a harvest festival. And we had the, there's Ed, Ed loves these instruments, he picks them up at Goodwill and fixes them. And we had the ninth graders come bring their plants that they started in their classroom. The ninth, you know, the high school's like, can you teach a class? So we want to do hands-on, they started seedlings, they brought them to the food forest, a month later, and we had a marching parade through the site to bring the plants, and it was like a little awkward. But like, this is how we do it. And we always circle up. We're like, whenever we talk, we have a circle, and we start out our work day with all hands in the middle, like that. And there's the Huffington Post people again with their cameras. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like those social permaculture things or those human connection things is like just you know you don't have to go all the way into the geek mode, but like just touch, you know, oh everybody, let's start this with intention. 
And this is Michael's art project on, you know, it's a very artistic compost bin. Nice. Mm. Some people think it don't work, doesn't work, but I do. So they store compost in it now instead of working it. Art project left over from the airport? Yes, we'll take the art project left over from the airport. It's a bee made out of wood. These little boys have grown up in the food forest. They know where everything is. Uh, flowering plants for the um, pollinators. Oops. What's a permaculture garden without a spiral, huh? Or a spiral, large yes. scale. This is uh, the entryway. We have some interesting and funky stuff. It's a contorted mulberry. All the herbs are up front there. That's a fuki plant. Here's the lupin outgrowing everything yeah. around it. It's massive. It's massive. With many plants, they self seed. Here we start, we're working with um, mashua. It's a root tuber from Peru. It has to come out of the ground in the winter, but you guys could grow it here. And it's, it's, a, you know, it's starchy and storagey. And we realized we have to label everything. So Julie, she's uh, worked so hard, she makes labels like that. And this was our first uh, weed or our first yield. We had all the wood chips. We put our trees in the ground, and around the trees were some soil. I said, kale, right? What kind of weed would you like? Would you like an edible weed? So we just started spreading kale seeds everywhere, and now they self-seed themselves. And you have to manage it. You're like, do you want so many kale that you always have the pests? No, so you have to take some out. So this is kale, and it self-seed itself. Again, obtain a yield right away. And this is aronia, all in a flourish. This is there's our bus stop in the background. And have some fun with it, you guys. Like, Design it so that you have blooming all these swaths, and then these turn red in the fall. The aronia berry is not so delicious. It also can stay on the plant for a long time. Put that in zone three. Put that in zone four. The birds will come for it if the people don't. One aronia plant last year, 20 pounds. Wow. Because people aren't used to that. People are like, how much is your yield? We have no idea. People walk through there all day long harvesting some berries. But they didn't know the aronia plant. So we got a little sense of that. We have 20 aronia plants, 20 pounds. 400 pounds of berries, two years after planting. So that's, only, that's the only statistic I can offer you around the food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is another lesson learned, see buckthorn, see berry. Does anyone know its botanical name? Hippocaranoids. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. It's a nitrogen fixer, right? Oh, we heard about that, it's thorny, but oh yeah, the, the seeds, the fruit takes radon out of the body, oh, Europe's got it. So we planted it, and it runs like heck. From the workshops and the books, no one ever told me that. Later, Skeeter's like, yeah, you put that on the back 40. <laughs> so we had to dig a trench around it and buy $200 worth of bamboo plastic. Plastic that's usually used to contain bamboo. I don't know, is that a really good solution? So it runs like, runs like will roots runs, or does it run and actually produce new trees? It produces new, tr new shrubs. And they're male and female. Uh -huh. So this whole hedge was female. We had to go buy some males. Because we, we, we tugged the ones out that were unsexed out from the rest of the landscape because we didn't want them running, so this was our hedge. So we have it, so we dug the bamboo thing in there, but that's $200 worth of bamboo plastic. We have bees kept on site. We had to negotiate with the city mm -hmm. that this guy could take care of the bees, take some of the honey, give us some of the honey. He called it pollinator services. So we get some honey. He's lost hive year after year. He doesn't use any um, chemicals. He just wants to see if he can get, he breeds queens too. And there you go, art again. And there's one of our trees early in the year, early years, that's the same tree, surrounded by the understory. Looks like the overstory, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And this is the strawberry ground cover again, and these are plants that are working with our nut guild. There are plants that have to work with your nut if it's in the Juglans genus. So Juglans are walnuts. Look at a book, that's what we did. And there's lists in, Par in um, Toby Hemingway's books and Dave Jackie books, what grows with the walnuts. Because some plants won't. But this one will, and this is again, it's the gumi and an elderberry in the background. Thimbleberry grows under the forest canopy, you guys who live in the other climes. Oh, we'll put a little bit of it here. It's out in the sun. It won't grow so fast. If we're really fast, it swallowed our fig tree. There's a fig tree in there. So, lesson learned. What? So you, so you say, well, Everything that seems to grow underground with its roots and then come up here is becoming problematic. So this is one of those. And so I might have to put it on the edge or put it near a path where you can make it better. Our raspberries have a disease. We're not sure what that is. It could be Phycophthora. So we're learning, right? This is not only just planting it and keep going. you got to take care of it. Again, there's that lupin. 
See that small stake? This is a stake that's in the center of a watering zone. So we had to water these for the first two or three years. We wanted teams of people watering them once or twice, twice a week. And this is a color stake. We, so that's a system that we had to create was like, how do you get people to water it? We didn't have an irrigation system. And our, our goal is to not have to water this thing. So um, call out for volunteers, 40 people sign up, have small trainings, give them a map, give them a zone. They're on their own. How you got to stake out the zone. You got to give them instructions on how to do water. And you got to give them the access key. But once that system's going, now we're in our third year of a watering system, it's, not, it's sort of an autopilot. And we had to come up with a $500 stipend for someone to coordinate that, because that was only fair. So we're starting to ask for stipends for schools. Yeah, can you do us a field trip? Yes. Do you have $50? Do you have a, stipends are nice. That's what I like to say, stipends are nice. Universities, one after the other, are coming. Would you, can you give us a tour? Can you teach a class for two hours? Yes, and stipends are nice. And so they're starting to come. And then it'll get complicated with the city because it's public land. And are you learning, earning money on public land? And is, are you using the land? And so that's, yes. <laughs> so do other parks, right? That's this area. And that's it afterwards. So it's getting a little thick. How do you educate people? And how do you, you know, keep them interested? So here it is in 2014 from Google Earth. You can see the spiral over there on the end. And here it is in 2016. These pictures wow. are hard to see. So it's getting greener. That's amazing. How much water annually does Seattle get? Uh, 40, about 40 inches. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A little, little different. Yeah, yeah. And we, the first year that we watered, we used as much water as one family household. Wow. wow. That's not a lot. But you know what? A family household in Seattle uses 200 gallons of water a day. What? Which you guys probably would be the same in Missoula. I mean, it's astounding, right? A family with one or two kids, 200 gallons a day. My household, we were three, and we were really conserving, and we used 50 a day. We're in a really conserving time. But 200, so we use, you know, one family's worth of water in the year. Uh, that was worth it to us. So I'm going to go fast because I'm really swallowing up time, and I thought we would break into smaller groups, but I think you're getting it. When, when you see a permaculture principle show up in this list or something I described in the story, just shout it out. So, you're going to need communication tools if you want to do this. And this is some of the things that I really learned. Learn to listen. Learn to interact. Yes. Face people. Like, look at them. If it's, if it's their culture to be looked at when you speak to them, like, face them and give them your time. Holy shit. So many people come back to this project because they feel this connection and they say they don't really have words for it but they like it, I was gonna leave Seattle but now I'm here I came here because of this project I volunteer like people feel valued because we're being human beings with them we're, we're listening to them and looking them we're facing each other and we, we circle up whenever we have you know if we were having a car I'd say can you move it so your back doesn't face each other like a circle is a way for people to communicate well have humility like usually when people ask me questions I usually say well what do you think before I give my mind, because I know my answer. Um, and so give that feedback that you're listening. You know, say a couple words or just be like, I'm sorry, I'm very distracted, or excuse me, um, I interrupted you. These are these aren't permaculture things necessarily, but these are they're working for social permaculture. Um, put your flyers in lots of languages, or the two languages, or more photographs, or large print. I lose on my eyesight now. I can't read all those little words. Put your flyers in bigger print for the people who don't see as well as the young ones. Realize you don't know what you don't know. That's a big thing about communication. And using value diversity would be these principles here. Observe and interact are some of the permaculture principles. And these are these are here to help us. These are our friends. And whenever we have a stumbling block, we think, what what can these teach us? Or go back to the ethics. Earth care people care fair share. That really guides us when we don't know, or we're like we're getting really heady about it. Like, okay, if we're in our heads, let's go over here and see how can we learn from the principles. So the second thing in your toolkit is build your dream. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? What gives you juice? And where are you going to do it? And what are you going to do? And how are you going to do it? And who are you going to do it with? Why are you doing this? And for me, that picture of that uh, pomegranate. The children, that's why I'm doing this. And the food. Uh, who says she's moving around a lot from North Idaho? I, the, I, in the time I've been in this project, I've moved twice. And I've changed my garden. 
I have a food source now. Mm -hmm. And I know that when I'm going to leave, I'm going to be able to go in there and get whatever I want out of that food forest because I'm creating a community to help care for it for the long term. And it's public land. It's commons for everybody. And if people don't take care of this so well in the future, if we get it going well enough as a forest, it's not going to take any more management than any of the other parts. Right? We may lose some of the understory, but we're going to have fruit trees now. And, and that's, that will need care. They're not like free, free for all. You can see that in this town. The apples are falling, so we need to take care of them. Build your team. Um, find at least two other people that are willing to commit with you for two years and learn how to get along and know that you're going to differ and learn how to differ. Um, empower interest in newcomers. Like I said, you got a project, you're interested, let's do it and create the feedback loops. So when your team and even if you have to go afterwards and you're like, that meeting really sucks, my stomach really hurts, I can't stand these meetings. And you get that from each other. We have these meetings up week after week, and the newcomers will be like, I can't stand that. I'm like, no, I, 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 ha, 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 like, like, yes. And other times you come out of you're like, you can't leave the parking lot because you're all talking, and you're enjoying what you're doing with the library closed. So you find a place to meet. And, and if anybody asks you about your project and it's hard to find places to meet, tell them that. It's really hard to find places to meet. And that was how they designed our, our country at some point. They didn't want us to have gathering clauses. The, the, the point I forgot to make on um, communication tools, um, create a 20-second elevator pitch about your project. Have that. <laughs> well, what are you up to? What are you doing? Or, hi, I'm, you know, you're at a, a, you're schmoozing. You're like, oh, by the way, I'm working with community on this project that's on public land. It's an edible park. So the more people you tell, the more. But get it, get it down and don't use the jargon. Just come up with a 20-second blurb, 10-second blurb of what it is, and that's how you build interest. So, um, oh, on building your team, celebrate yourselves. Always have fun. Be inclusive. Create unity and ownership with the orange scarf. I mean, you could be inclusive. Somebody shows up and like, I can help with the kids. Here's an orange scarf. Like, a way that you can identify yourselves, but no, don't be exclusive about it. Um, use inclusive language. When we talk about the project, say we, not I. Because as, as long as I say I, somebody's going to turn to me and think that I'm going to take care of it, and I'm going to do it, and that gets really tiring. Just, just, uh, you say we, and then someone's been around for a couple of work parties, and they keep showing up, and they say, you guys, and it's <laughs> we. Like, you remind them that, you know, that now they're part of it. So use really, use the we the language. And share the spotlight. I am so tired of interviewing with media. And so when they want to interview me because I'm one of the founders, I say, by the way, I'm going to bring someone with me. So I usually bring a young person with me, and they're pretty jazzed. And soon they're going to, they, I have already been like, you know, you, you go to that panel. You can, can, would you like to speak at this such and such night? And it's really great to share the spotlight because they have a lot of fun with it. Build interest in your project. So um, once you have tangibles, We've got some land, or we got an idea, or we got a crew, we made, we called ourselves this. Go out, go out to Rotary Clubs. They have money, they want to give money and time. So go to the Rotary Clubs, they meet in the mornings. Go to senior centers, go to the schools, like family nights or the PTA. Um, and uh, spread the word about what's, oh, the community centers. Community centers, they have kids come after school. Do you want to do a garden plot out here? And it's going to be a volunteer first. Host field trips and summer camps. And when you start having a site, yeah, come on out. And um, plant those recognizable crops. To build interest in your project, put in those pumpkins, put in those red, bright red shiny berries with signs on them or stuff. Celebrate the beauty, put in pretty things. Find diverse types of people to join your team. Find the grandmas, find the teenagers, find the offbeat kids. I mean, there's people in our project that are homeless people that really enjoy coming because they have a sense of community. There's people who are Microsoft employees that are tired of working with their hands on computers they want to dig in the dirt. So just diversity, and then we get to meet each other, and that's really what it's all about. Um, definitely do some family nights at schools, especially if they're close to the project location or go to the school for some public land. Find your allies. Oh, find out what is important to your community. So we found out that they wanted community allotment plots, they wanted blueberries, they wanted a place to gather. Discover what is important to the decision makers. So in Seattle, they're really big on diversity right now. They, they're like, they're di every, anything you do has to have a diversity plan, outreach plan. So find out what's important in your town. 
Is the health really important everywhere? Yes. Find the health department. Do they, do they, would they love to help support you in some way? Maybe they're your umbrella organization. Maybe the city will give you a piece of land if the health department is partnering with you. Find people in strategic spots that are your allies. Um, senior centers, maybe at-risk youth center needs a place to send kids. So you start making relationships with other people. That you spoke about that yesterday. Um, we get grants from an organization called uh, the Conservation District. Every county has a soil conservation district, conserving soil and water. That's what we're doing. So we go ask them for some money. So they're decision makers. What's important to them? Or stuff for kids to do after school. Those community centers have kids coming. So go uh, find out what's important to them. If it aligns, you've got a partner. They're your allies. So finding your allies is definitely part of it. Jeffrey, where else do you go for grants? Are they national organizations or are they more locally based? It's, I apply, we apply to national. We haven't gotten as many as we go with local. Local, we're a lot more successful because they know us. We invite them out. Testimonials, someone writes you a thank you note, save it, use it on your, save it and use it in your grant application. Build on your assets and know your food forest plants. So if you have land, host events, host classes, even if you don't have much there, use your assets, um, use it as a classroom, and maybe you're the emergency hub. In Seattle, we are an earthquake emergency hub. If there is an earthquake, there probably won't be plums on the tree at that time. But if people know that they're going to come to our site and problem solve together, that's where you are building community and resiliency and strength. It's like, I know you. I know you. Yeah, yeah. It's like almost the same as lifting sandbags together when you're digging trenches and, and moving chips and wheelbarrows. It's, you're building this um, emergency um, plan. Um, be willing to feel uncomfortable. You are going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to feel uncomfortable going up to the city hall. You're going to be feel uncomfortable when somebody complains. You're going to feel uncomfortable differing with each other. You're going to be tired. Find someone close to talk to you that's not involved in the project. <laughs> that's willing to hear you and also give you a reality check. You know, my friends, for about three or four years, my friends kept saying, you said you were going to do less. You said you were going to get at you. You said you weren't going to do that anymore. You know, because I was doing 20 hours a week easily volunteer for this project and my you, you said you were going to do less you said that last year and i have to say i'm finally like um you know doing like maybe three hours a week i'm finally like less so because there's a great team and um feed yourselves feed your soul rest like definitely needed and i go volunteer at other organizations because i don't have to lead and I get to learn about how they do it. I've done the kayaktivism in Seattle Harbors. I've gone, I've shut down Chase Bank, and all I do is hold the banner. And I love it. Like, so it gives me a break, and it gives me insight, and maybe even like a breath from other things. Or, I'll, or I just take off. And come off. Mm -hmm. so, this is a picture of um, Seattle Central Community College. South, no, South Seattle Community College. It was a strip of land next to the parking lot. Narcisa in the red hat. She said, I want to go to field for, food forest then. Because she heard about us and she learned from us. And there's a class we're having in it two years later. This is a, an example of a design process with the community. People write stuff down. They put it on paper. You can get up and move around. And here's the principles that I used. You can find that on the web. That's that. And that's me. This was after a really hard trip to visit family, and I came straight to the food forest and took that picture. Mm -hmm. I made me happy in front of the canopy of the crab apple. Can you go back? There? Yeah. Um, any questions? It's already new. Yes. You were talking about nonprofit status and like, well, the state, you said there were like two steps and you mentioned the state status. I don't know if you continued with your state status. Good one. There. So this, so once you become an incorporated body, as an incorporated nonprofit at your state level, then you can apply to the federal level with the IRS to become a 501c3. So that's a category. In that, in that capacity, once you get that, it takes about a year, I understand. I think it should take less. You do need to do paperwork. It takes about 40 hours to do that paperwork. Once you have that status at the federal level, then you can receive donations, and you can receive money, and you can open up a bank account. But if you, if you just do the first step and you become incorporated, you can actually get insurance as an incorporated body. 
But you need a board. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, do you have just anything to say about all of this, but in relation to smaller communities? Instead of like a thing yeah. like small? Yes. Um, what, um, does anybody have an idea? Before I answer, what would you, how would you answer her question? Uh, go to your neighborhood. What, who, who are the people in your neighborhood? Who are the people on your, I'm talking about hot springs. Who are the people on your city council? Get to know your city council member. I mean, I've been here six weeks. I had a problem next door. I went to my neighbors first. I went to my city council. Um, within four weeks, you solved the problem, and it was huge. It was right next door, right outside my kitchen. And I started with my neighbors, and I said, are you experiencing this? You know, I, I mean, I'm laying over a problem versus what we're talking about here, but it's the same thing. I went, and I'm looking at this piece of land that I described earlier in my backyard. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go to my neighbors and say, do you want to do a garden here? I'm going to go to my city council members who live in my neighborhood. I'm going to go to every city council meeting and sit and listen to what they do. So that's what I'm doing in a town of 500. Or that's my, my process mm -hmm. in just the last month. So. Anybody else? I'd say go for a smaller scale project. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And I think, well, it depends. Like in Bozeman, we're about 40,000 people. And it's that I find that that scale is really good in terms of being able to kind of talk to city commissioners. We know the mayor. You know, it's, it's just they're that much more accessible because this town is smaller. And, um, and it's easier to access people who, like in Seattle or Denver, where I used to live, I'd never think to go talk to the mayor. Yeah. Right. The council members are accessible. They're yeah. supposed to be in yeah. any, anywhere. Can come out and commissioners. Yeah. Or neighborhood associations as well is a good place to start, too. And if you want to consider public land as church or library, you can go straight into those institutions first. You, know, you may not have to get approval by a county, county commissioner or something. The other thing that I did with the problem that I also would do with the garden is that with the problem when I started, my neighbors said, well, that's your problem. And I said, no, that's our problem. Yeah. And it took me four weeks before the language changed from my problem because I live next door to our problem and what are we going to do together. And then they started telling me because they had been here longer than me. They're like, well, Kath, we should do this. Well, Kath, Oh, we're going to do that? So are you going to help me do that? Will you call that council member and talk to them? And I'll call this council Will you yes. call that neighbor? Share well, I don't know that neighbor. So why don't we go over together and meet that neighbor? Go. And there were neighbors in my end of my neighborhood, here in Hot Springs, who had lived here for years, who didn't know their neighbors. And by the end of solving this problem, they knew their neighbors because we had met. And we called ourselves a neighborhood. And even went to city council uh, or to our police chief. He said, what do you want, Kathy? I said, no, I'm not here alone. See, see my neighbors? You know, I live next door, and just because I'm talking, I, it's we. And then I get quiet, and everybody else would start talking. So it really, I find the inclusiveness and the we and stepping out of the limelight really early. Everyone starts, I learn more from everyone around me than I knew at, in the beginning at all about how to solve what was going on. So I'm taking the same thing to the garden. I'm going to go to my neighbors and say, so what do you want to do with this piece of land that's on my land, but I want to make it our land? See the answers in the room. I didn't even have to answer that question. The answers. Mm -hmm. Jeff, yes. do you get any pushback around chop and drop and things looking unmanaged and unmaintained? You know, like the... We, we started early on telling people that this was not going to look like a park or a garden and that yeah. this is what nature looks like. It was going to be messy. We say, it's going to look messy. Or it's going to look like an impressionist painting. I say that too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is what nature does. And this is, you know, it, it reduces the impact. We don't have to haul in or haul out. We try and keep everything on site. Chop it, chop it and in the hot compost that we have to see. Okay. Anything else? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I've been to a lot of permaculture, you're like working in Seattle, I've been to a bunch of permaculture action days where you've got all these people there, they're super excited to do, and at the levels of like 50, 50 60, 70 volunteers, 
it can get pretty chaotic and difficult to allocate tasks to people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, what were some strategies you had for dealing with that? We have a meeting Tuesday before the Saturday. We always have a Tuesday meeting. Mm -hmm. And we, we start planning a work party on the Tuesday. So we list the tasks that need to be done and we talk about it. We get there early, before the 10 o'clock arrival of folks. We get there at 9. We put all those tasks on a chalk door. We circle up at 9.30. We say, who wants to do what? And you have names next to those tasks. 10 o'clock, people come. They drink their coffee. Five minutes in, we introduce, hello, welcome. Here's our task for today. Weeding. Or, you know, it's not, it's not as general as weeding the world. Weeding the gravel paths. And then we're like, can you explain what you're doing? And then he's like, I'm going to be doing that. And come meet me over here at the end. Okay. Next task. Oh, building the hugel culture bed. Can you describe what you're doing, Jill? Says, I'm going to I'm going to build a hugel bed. That's this. Simply. We're going to learn that method. Blah, blah, blah. And then she... So, even in the circle up, it's a lot of people like, oh, 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 oh. So, we're like, all right, we're going to... And this is our agenda. We're going to have lunch at 1 o'clock. So people disperse to the different leaders that have said that they're going to work. There's a roamer. She's always, you know, Jackie's going to be the roamer. So she checks around and someone comes up and they're like, I don't like what I'm doing. And I'm like, oh, look at the chalkboard. You, you want to go over there? Okay, go there. And I'm rowing. Like, you need any more people? Yeah, I need three more people. Okay, volunteers show up. You can go over there. So it's, it's been a process. I'm like, God, I used to feel really exhausted after those. And now I won't because there's leaders who are repeated. But we still have, like, 40 people who can be a leader on a work party day. And some of them won't show up to a work party for six or seven months and then they show up They're like, George, can you do this? And then there's people who just want to set up a lunch or cut bread or um, pick up micro trash, um, play with kids. Does that answer your question? And, and, and like as, you know, to do the welcome, like I don't want to do the welcome anymore. Like wait, there's a young person, she's come to enough meetings, like do you want to do the welcome? Yes. No, like, sure. You know, like, all right. And then they're nervous and they're like, and so you plant each other, you like ask the question, oh, like, what does that mean? You know, or like, or, oh, and then we do a safety talk. We always do a safety talk where we set out a tool and someone trips on it in a funny way. And we're like, man, first date kids here and take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Oh, and this is something we learn to do. We're like, who is, this is the first time here? Raise your hand. So they look around. Okay, raise your hand if you've been here before. Find each other. Talk to the new people. And so that's been a way to help build community. Like, oh, make these other people feel comfortable. Teach them how to, where to wash the tools at the end of the day. More questions? Yeah, smaller projects start small and simple. This swallowed my life for the last seven years, and I'm kind of like, Ugh. and I'm reaping the awards. I get to sit here and tell you the story. And, um, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.